Hey, let's bring in the Secretary of State of West Virginia, Mac Warner. Mac, good morning to you. Hey, good morning. Great to be with you. And when I think of Tuesdays, I think of Mac Warner Day, Mac, because <laughs> Tuesdays when we do election days. Absolutely, and they are upon us. Uh, you know, a number of municipalities around the state, uh, in fact, 114 towns or cities around West Virginia are having their elections either today or many of them next week, uh, and some have already had them. But uh, everybody should be tuned in to your local municipality, and uh, if this is an election day for you, then uh, make sure you get out and vote. Mac, why do municipalities have a separate election cycle than the rest of the regular voting that goes on? Well, some of it is due to city charters. And uh, when they were formed or organized, they wrote it into their constitution, basically, or their charters to uh, when elections would be. Uh, and then otherwise, uh, for various reasons, uh, just like school levies and other bonds, sometimes they like to have them on Saturdays or uh, at weird times for political reasons, uh, you know, sometimes they want uh, less turnout. They just don't want those people interested to go vote. But I don't want to assign nefarious uh, reasons to it. Uh, they're, they're just a variety of reasons. But what we have seen lately in the legislature is an effort to allow cities to align their elections with what we would call the major election. This is referred to as an off-year election because it's not a – a presidential election year or even a congressional election year, uh, those come in the even numbers. The you know, next one will be 24. Um, so this is 2023. It's a uh, year for some of these municipalities to have their elections. And the legislature, the West Virginia legislature, has said if you want to align them with the major elections, you can. Uh, there's a number of cost-saving benefits to it, other efficiencies, and you would probably have a higher turnout to vote on these uh, city officials. Uh, and a number of cities like that, they want that cost savings. They want that uh, alignment. Uh, other cities, they don't want to have their elections lost in the shuffle of the major elections. So there are pros and cons to it. And what our legislature has done is allowed that to be left up to the municipalities to decide whether they want to align those elections or not. John, you had a follow up. Yeah, wouldn't that? I mean, I mean, from what you said, I mean, wouldn't that save the municipalities a lot of money? I mean, I always think about the local election here in Martinsburg, and I know it costs them, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to hold a separate election. I mean, just fiscally taking care of the people's money. I mean, it just it just makes sense to lump it in with the regular election day. It, it does, and think of the efficiencies with regards to poll workers and. Uh, getting the machines ready and all the other administration that goes on with it. There's just as much work to run a city election as it does you know, when you run these county elections. Remember, in these larger elections, the county officials are the one running those presidential elections and the congressional elections and so forth. Uh, this election that we're talking about right now is a municipal, so the municipal clerk is running those. Um, and since they don't run them as often as the counties do, there's a train-up period. Let's say you have a new city clerk or whatever. Um, a lot of times there is training that goes on between the county clerks and the municipal clerks, uh, but the emphasis is uh, getting to the right clerk because the city clerks are the ones putting the ballot uh, ballots together right now for this election. If you have a question about the hours or early voting, uh, that sort of thing, you would be going through the municipal clerk now. So the point that you make is, is very valid. Uh, there, there would be considerable cost savings to align the municipal elections with the uh, county elections. But there are also some issues with regards to the lines being drawn. You know, in the last two elections now, we've gone through the census and the redistricting. There were a lot of line changes uh, with regards to precincts and districts and so forth. Well, now when you start to align the city elections with a county election, you might have a city ward to, say, elect a city council member. Um but that ward line may not align with the county's districts for their uh, precinct uh, precincts and so on. So it's not a real simple matter of just saying we're going to change the election date. There's a lot of administration that goes on behind the scenes to make sure that that is appropriate. So we really do need to leave it up to county commissions to work with the municipalities to see whether aligning those elections does make sense. Uh, or you want to project it a few years out uh, and make those line realignments um, very public in a very transparent way so people understand uh, why this is occurring when they go to a, or they don't have the city election when they're expecting it uh, and they're voting perhaps in a new place. 
Hey, Mac, this is John Gilstrap. Good morning. On the, sure. Good morning. On the even year elections, there's always a lot of drama about the reliability of elections and, and whether the machines work properly and all of that. Is obviously on, on the off year elections, you don't get quite that publicity. But are the standards any different? Well, let me assure everybody in West Virginia that we do not have the machines, the Dominion machines that uh, were at the center of so much controversy uh, nation, nationwide. And also here in West Virginia, we haven't changed the rules, and that's what happened in a lot of these locations where they accepted ballots after the election was over or accepted ballots through a drop box or through an automatic uh, voter registration type situation or registrations occurred outside the time period. So there were a whole lot of different uh, – actions that took place that caused that concern, from, especially from the 2020 election. And many of those are still lingering, but the vast majority of those issues really occurred in about seven locations around the United States, seven key cities and seven key counties in the seven swing states. And we can go through it, Fulton County, uh, you know, in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, Maricopa County out in uh, Arizona, uh, up in Detroit, uh, Michigan, uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, there are seven places that are battlegrounds that determine basically the outcome of a presidential election. And that's where a lot of these uh, activities occurred. It's, it's still under um, a lot of scrutiny. And I'm not sure that they've changed much. The only place that I've seen real change is in Wisconsin, Wisconsin, where they allowed drop boxes. They allowed people to put uh, ballots into, I think it was 520 drop boxes around the state. But after that 2020 election, Lawsuits were filed, and it went to the Wisconsin Supreme Court, and they decided drop boxes are illegal in, West, in, in Wisconsin, and so they will not use drop boxes in the future unless or until the state legislature specifically says the county clerks can use uh, drop boxes. So that's the one place that I think has actually taken action to clean up uh, some of the either nefarious or the concerned uh, areas in the election. I think that needs to occur in a number of other places around the United States. You saw the Georgia legislature trying to do that, and there was serious pushback. If you might remember, they moved the Major League Baseball All-Star Game from Atlanta to Denver as a result of saying the, the legislature was trying to do too much. As it turned out, one of the things they did do was implement voter ID uh, laws in Georgia, and the percentages actually went up between 2020 and 2022. More people voted. Uh, it, it may be counterintuitive, but when you add a security requirement, people have more confidence in the elections, and then they get out and vote. So that's where I fall down on this is I want a security component with every access that is provided, whether it's mail-in ballots, whether it's early voting, whether it's absentee, that sort of thing. Those are fine as long as there is a security component that makes sure those ballots are just as valid as somebody who votes in person on Election Day. Hey, Mac, it's Jonathan again. Um, and when they moved it, correct me if I'm wrong, I, but didn't uh, weren't the election laws even tougher in uh, in Colorado and, of course, tougher in Delaware, Joe Biden's home state, when there was just when there was all the uproar in Atlanta? And wasn't it and the downtown Atlanta, which is where it would have which is where the, the Major League Baseball All-Star game would have been, where they said something like one hundred million dollars worth of revenue would have come in which was mainly a, and which is, is a very African-American. It's a very diverse city. It's a great city. But all they did really was, was cost a lot of small business owners and a lot of people a lot of money in the interest of just making a statement that really didn't matter, that, that wasn't true. You're exactly right. They shot themselves in the foot on that one, and I think they regret it, and I don't think they will have that sort of uh, flat you know, pushback in the future. But what it was was it was a talking point, so it wasn't reality. It wasn't based on fact. It was simply a talking point to try to push back, uh, to try to make uh, the legislature look bad. You've got politics, and surprise, surprise, you know, because we're a Republican uh, legislature, and it was the, the elected two Democrat senators, one in 20 and one in 22, and uh, or in, in the runoff, and uh, it was due to, uh, you know, I think in, in part uh, to the former president saying, "Don't trust the elections, don't vote, uh, you know, early, uh, vote on election day." And when you have that sort of thing happen, you have one side that's rolling up the votes with early voting and mail-in voting and absentee voting, um, and the other side waiting till election day, and then on election day. 
well, we don't really trust the machines or it's too crowded or it's too hot or whatever, and it cost us, uh, at least on the conservative side, I think two Senate seats there in Georgia. So now I think a number of people are looking at this situation and saying, look, if the rules are that you can vote early or you can vote by mail, let's do it so that both sides have an equal chance at uh, winning elections. If you win the election, then you can change the rules back to where it's more secure. But right now, um, uh, those are the rules, so let's all play by the same rules. Mac, is there evidence uh, in any of these states that are trying to make it as easy as possible for people to vote, which conceptually is makes sense. You you don't want to make it a you know a, you don't want to have to run a marathon to cast your ballot here. Uh, but is there any evidence that it's increasing voter turnout in states that are making it easier to cast your ballot? And, and you know what I mean by that, which is you know, mailing your ballot in or, or, or voting in non-traditional ways uh, as opposed to turning up yourself at a, a location and voting in person. Well, if you listen to the liberals of the progressive side, they'll, of course, say that it increases voter turnout. The, the, the actuality, the numbers are, are not that, that people will find a way to vote if they're interested in voting. Uh, when they make that claim that it's easier to vote, well, if you allowed people to vote at Burger King, yeah, it makes it easier, and you can push that number. But do you really want people voting at Burger King and a thousand other places? And that's what I, I say that somewhat facetiously, but then you have President Biden who put out an executive order, 14019, that said he's going to make the 600 federal agencies, every time you touch a federal agency, that it becomes a voter registration center. And the clerks are just are apoplectic about this. They, they don't want that at all because think of the duplications that you would have in one place somebody goes in and registers as John Smith, and the next place it's uh, John S. Smith, and you know whatever. Every time you're touching an agency you know, for health care or um, food stamps or a driver's license or whatever, um, you're registering. Or, or you're, you have this opportunity to register, or as you're coming out of jail, they say, okay, here's a form to fill out to clear your paper, you know, to get your belongings back, and I'll hear, by the way, register to vote. Uh, but somebody may not be finished with parole and that sort of thing. There's County clerks are designed to uh, give voter registrations. DMVs are designed to give driver's license. Let's not mix those two. I don't want my office and my clerks to have to give driver's license and I don't think the DMVs and other federal agencies uh, or government agencies should be doing voter registrations. It causes too much duplication of effort because when those duplications come in, now it's up to those overworked county clerks to figure out which which one is correct. They might have two different addresses. They might have two different you know, middle initials, names, whatever that are being used. And now the county clerk has to sort that out. In today's world of technology, you can get online and register to vote. We don't need government agencies handing people pieces of paper and say, oh, you need to register to vote. Yes, it makes it easier, but it complicates the system. That's the bottom line. Well, but, but I mean, on the positive note, Mac, if you can register to vote at Burger King and everywhere else and you can register a few times, you know, it makes it easier to vote early and often, you know? That's I mean, isn't problem. that part of the purpose of it? Well, and see, that's where West Virginia is. We used to be the laughing stock of the nation with us in Cook County, Illinois, you know, were the places where the – uh, you did have that vote early, vote often uh, going on, and we've always changed that. We Now West Virginia is at the top of election security. I've been asked to testify in front of Congress four times now to talk about our successes. We've taken off over 400,000 names from the voter registration lists in West Virginia. That's how bad it had gotten, and now people are taking note of that, and Congress is saying, you know, Secretary of State in West Virginia, come tell us how you did it, what you did, what you recommended these other states to clean up their elections. We follow the law. We don't change the rules in the middle of the game, and uh, we have very high confidence. That's the key in all this is high confidence in the elections, both the election process, the tallying, and then the reporting. We report election results on election night, and that's what people want and expect, and then you don't have those conspiracy theories at all. They saw how many votes they needed. They went and got it. They created it and so on. That doesn't happen in West Virginia. At least it doesn't anymore. It may have in the past, but not anymore. So I'm very proud of it. I think all West Virginians should be proud of our election system here. Let's keep it that way and uh, not go down that path of laughing at voter fraud anymore. So shifting gears, this is Gilstrap again. Shifting gears, what are your thoughts on the debt ceiling compromise that came out between the White House and the House? Well, that's a situation that uh, I, I'm 
I think inflation is killing us. It's it's it, it's the hidden tax uh, that really is not so much hidden anymore. Um, just look at the people start talking about whether the price the price of gas at you know three fifteen is it, oh man that's good because it's not three sixty seven or whatever. Folks, it was one eighty seven when President Trump left office. Okay, so we're talking you know not quite double what it what it was when Trump left office. We need a conservative back in the White House who doesn't uh, just look at inflation as the way to you know give out the, the programs to make them look good to have you know check mark on what they got accomplished with you know. Uh, various infrastructure deals and so forth. Yes, we all love the infrastructure, but we're all paying for it, and we need to be transparent about uh, the process. And so uh, I, I think there are a lot of other ways uh, to go about things than uh, just continuing to let the current people in office look good and pass that debt on to our the next generation. I'm just not in favor of that. But wasn't it refreshing? Wasn't there a refreshing element out of this that the parties going into the debt ceiling, everybody was firewalled to the left and to the right. And when the door finally opened, there was, in fact, a compromise. Nobody got everything they wanted and something got done. Isn't that encouraging? Yes, politics is the art of compromise, and we do have to pull together at times. And that was uh, one of the times. But uh, what, what got us to that? I mean, why did we have to get to the brinksmanship if we had a balanced budget? Um, you know, constitutional uh, requirement, that sort of thing, uh, we wouldn't get into these situations. There are other ways of dealing with this than getting to the brink and playing brinksmanship and then all patting ourselves on the back because we got to a compromise to raise the debt ceiling once again. It's just uh, we're heading in the wrong brick. I think, you know, balanced budget is one of those things that we all talk about. But in reality, if you had to live under it at the federal level, nobody would want to, Mac, because everybody's going to lose something under a balanced budget. And this country is filled with people who cry, I want a balanced budget, but aren't willing to give up anything to get it for them but that would hurt themselves. I've become cynical about the balanced budget thing over time. I, I really have, honestly. How can you not well, be? And I, I got to say, I don't, I don't see anything good coming from that compromise. I don't see that it is us uh, saying, wow, we're moving forward. We're starting to get along. A pipeline in West Virginia. It's the one, but yeah, I mean, that was a good thing, but I'm saying, but the one thing that always comes to a compromise between the parties is the debt ceiling. In the end, they know everyone knows we can't default. So there will be a compromise. There are plenty of other things that just keep going from year to year with no compromise. I don't think it's a sign that the parties are, are working together. I think it's a sign that nobody wanted America to go off the cliff. That's the only thing. Hey, I want to get I'm going to bring this back onto the tracks here with Mac Warner back to municipal elections, which we have over a hundred of those over the next two Tuesdays today and uh, next Tuesday in uh, West Virginia. Mac, uh, and this kind of goes back to the beginning. If I miss this, I apologize. Do you have the same oversight of municipal elections that you have over other elections in the state? No, it's more of a partnership where we work with the county clerks and the county clerks are work working with these municipalities. I do have my field team out. We will have our investigators out. So we are participants, but there isn't the same level of oversight uh, that we have with the uh, uh, county clerks and, and their uh, administration, but it, it's a cooperative. It's a team effort that we're all pulling together, uh, helping with training, helping with the uh, you know uh, validation of the machines, those sorts of things. Anybody that needs help knows that they can call the Secretary of State's office, and uh, that we we will respond. So, uh, yes, it, uh, I, I do want to emphasize that we still have our fraud line open, so we do help in the investigations and so forth. If anybody sees something. They can uh, use our See Something, Tech Something program. Again, this is where we use technology. We're leading the nation with this, and other states are now following the West Virginia lead. So everybody, every citizen who has a cell phone is basically an extension of our investigative team. If you see something nefarious going on, take a picture of it, take a video, send it in. And then we've got our field team and our investigators out throughout the state. We can put somebody in pretty much every precinct or every location within about an hour anywhere around the state to begin an investigation if it's so warranted. The key to this, though, is really just the deterrent value that now people know that uh, we are uh, talking about things like this and see something, tech something program. So hopefully that will keep somebody from doing the electioneering, standing by the, the polling or the precinct door and shaking hands and handing somebody a slate saying vote this way. Uh, that's not permitted. And uh, people taking pictures of that can stop it, uh, you know, either on the spot or we can investigate it very quickly. So. Our fraud hotline is still open, uh, the fraud WB hotline, so you can call that in. You can see something, text something, 
uh, let us know if there's an issue, uh, and we will be visiting every one of these voting locations um, or municipalities uh, during the election uh, time frame. So uh, we are vigilant. We are out there watching, and uh, we want people to use our services if they're needed. And, Mac, you mentioned uh, previously in this segment uh, controversial Dominion voting machines. Of course, that was the subject of a gigantic lawsuit, cost Fox over three-quarters of uh, of a billion dollars. And just to make sure, a legal cleanup on our end, I don't want to be named in a lawsuit by the next group of Dominion executives because of that comment, you were not insinuating in any way that those voting machines were in any way uh, unreliable, were you? No. Uh, the West Virginia doesn't use Dominion voting machines, so that's outside my field of expertise to opine whether it's they're good, bad, or otherwise. Uh, I can say that I'm pretty confident around the United States that the machines are not connected to the internet. And so, uh, but uh, again, my expertise is on, you know, we, we use the express vote system here in West Virginia. Over 95% of the people are now voting on the express vote system. I think it's the best one uh, in the world. And uh, I'm very confident in the systems that we use here in West Virginia. And, uh, don't want to get into the Dominion because I don't have that. Uh, it, I don't have oversight over Dominion voting machines. Mac, I appreciate your time this morning. Thank you so much. Great, always good being with you all. Thanks, Secretary Thanks, of State Mac Warner.